we know now that, that the history of the amphitheatre site goes back to uh, 8,000 years um, to the Mesolithic period. And uh, we've also found the remains of an Iron Age roundhouse here. But what I want to uh, concentrate on today is the history of the Roman amphitheatre itself and its subsequent impact on this part of the city and its development. Uh, thanks uh, must go to Peter Carrington and Julian Baum for recording this virtual tour of the Chester Amphitheatre today. Uh, it's, it's on behalf of the Chester Heritage Festival. Uh, the Archaeological Society uh, have decided to, to provide a virtual tour of the amphitheatre. I'm very excited to find out all, all about it. And one of my first questions is, uh, Peter, what was the origin of, of the amphitheatre uh, and what happened in them? The, the word amphitheatre literally means an amph a theatre on both sides, or as we might put it, a theatre in the round. And that's exactly what it is. And amphitheatres were one of the few types of buildings that the Romans developed for themselves and didn't have a Greek origin. From the start, amphitheatres uh, were closely linked to glad gladiatorial combat. Not even the Romans themselves knew where uh, gladiator games came from. Um, the earliest ones that we know about uh, were held to celebrate uh, the victory of the people of Campania. That's the area of Italy uh, around Naples over a neighbouring tribe, the Samnites, in 310 BC. They then came to be adopted uh, as part of the funeral games of uh, the Roman nobility. Again, the first one we know about uh, was held in 264 BC at the funeral of a man called uh, Decimus uh, Junius Brutus Sciva. Later on in the first century BC, as competition between Roman aristocrats uh, intensified, uh, uh, gladiator games, uh, gladiator combats uh, became uh, a form of entertainment to get support of the masses of, of the population. The first examples of amphitheatres that we know of were again built in Campania in, in the first century BC. They appeared after the end of a war between Rome and her Italian allies. And they were built in cities where mil military uh, colonies were installed to ensure their loyalty and where maintaining a military ethos was uh, obviously important. They don't appear in Rome itself until a little bit later. Uh, and at first, uh, gladiatorial combats were staged uh, in temporary amphitheatres and uh, in the Forum and in the Circus Maximus until uh, in the later 1st century AD uh, uh, all these were replaced by the Colosseum. In the western provinces of the Empire the most important influences in spreading uh, uh, Roman values, the Roman way of life, uh, were the army and the cult of the emperors. And again, uh, amphitheatres and the activities that went on in, in them had uh, an, imp a, an important role. In garrison towns such as Chester, of course, uh, gladiatorial games were important in uh, maintaining an, uh, the uh, military ethos and displaying uh, uh, mi uh, military virtues, the ability to fight well and to die well. Again, in the reign of Augustus, uh, a regular programme of amphitheatre events emerged with beast hunts and fights in the morning, executions at lunchtime and uh, the star of the show, gladiatorial combat in the afternoon. All of these are shown on a very well-preserved mosaic from the villa of Darbuk Amera near Tripoli in uh, present-day Libya. The first beast hunts were held in 186 BC and uh, as the Roman Empire expanded, so ever more exotic uh, animals were brought into the arena, especially from North Africa. 
in Britain were more likely to have seen uh, bears, bulls, bulls and stags in the arena. Uh, this may all seem very cruel to us, but we have to remember that Roman values were very different. Uh, uh, wild animals still posed a really uh, severe risk to uh, rural populations. Uh, uh, it was a world where there were animal sacrifices. And we have to remember that bear baiting and cockfighting were only abolished in this country in 1835. Condemned prisoners might be executed in a very a variety of gruesome ways, especially being cast to wild animals. The first time that uh, we know this happened was uh, in 146 BC when a number of army deserters uh, were executed. Uh, many gladiators were uh, prisoners of war or criminals of various sorts uh, who had been reprieved and specially trained and they had the chance to literally uh, uh, win a new life for themselves by showing skill and courage in the arena. Some free citizens uh, chose to be gladiators uh, either to escape from poverty or simply out of a sense of adventure. Uh, gladiators uh, were the lowest of the low socially, but like sports stars today, uh, uh, could achieve c uh, considerable fame. Uh, again, we have to remember that uh, uh, gladiatorial combat was not always a fight to the death. Training gladiators simply cost uh, too much money. We have some information on life expectancy from Tombstone. There, there was one man who died at the age of 30, who had survived 30, 34 fights. Uh, some gladiators uh, married and had children. In their retirement, they could go on to become uh, gladiator trainers themselves or to become referees. Then as now, uh, people like novelty and uh, left-handed gladiators uh, were uh, thought to be of particular interest. So it may be that the carved slate relief showing a left-handed net thrower, um, a ratiarius, found in Newgate Street in Chester in 1741, uh, may actually depict a well-known gladiator who fought in Chester rather than just being a st stock depiction. Uh, what sort of places in Britain had amphitheatres, Peter? What was special about them? In Britain, amphitheatres can be broadly divided into, into two types. Those associated with the uh, towns that served as the capitals of the native tribes and those associated with army bases. Those in the towns were fairly simply constructed. Uh, an arena was dug into the, the ground or into a hillside and the spoil from that excavation was uh, put around the side to form an earthen bank uh, and the uh, walls of the arena uh, and the passageways into the, the arena uh, uh, might be revetted with timber. The ones associated with the army, especially the legionary fortresses, uh, were more elaborate. Uh, they had uh, st uh, stone arena walls, stone uh, uh, pa uh, gate passage walls and uh, also stone outer walls. In the uh, th third century, the Chester Amphitheatre was particularly elaborate and was the largest in Britain. Now, why this was, we don't know. Uh, it may just have been a matter of convenience to enlarge the amphitheatre by a certain amount, or it may have <coughs> had some symbolic importance. We think this happened under the Emperor Septim Septimius Severus, who died at York in uh, two AD 211. But uh, whatever uh, purpose he may have had uh, for Chester and its amphitheatre, well, died with him. The Chester Amphitheatre was discovered in 1929, when a curved buttress wall was discovered during the construction of a heating room for an extension 
to the house, which at that time was a convent school. Convent school. And in fact, uh, this bit of wall was discovered just over there. It was noticed by a member of the Archaeological Society, a man called W.J. Williams, known as Walrus Williams because of his moustache, and he instantly recognised uh, the similarity of this wall to part of the amphitheatre that had uh, just been excavated at uh, Kyleian down in South Wales. And uh, then Chester knew it had an amphitheatre and we knew where it was. Again in 1929, Chester Corporation planned a new road directly across the site of the amphitheatre cut out, to cut out uh, Little St John Street, which at that time had a lot of sharp bends in it, which have now, of course, been evened out. Uh, excavations were quickly mounted by the Archaeological Society, uh, and these showed the size and plan of the building. After a vigorous campaign by the Society, ultimately the uh, Ministry of Transport refused the Council uh, permission to construct the road. Ultimately, in uh, the 1960s, uh, large-scale excavations uh, were carried out, which uh, exposed the amphitheatre uh, more or less as you can see it today. Unfortunately, uh, even in the words of the uh, leader of that excavation, the work was done in a rather ham-fisted way. Uh, uh, some of the areas that were excavated were not excavated thoroughly and a lot of information uh, survived to be examined later. On the other hand, uh, the arena was uh, excavated to within 60 centimetres of the original floor uh, mechanically and in that way uh, uh, 1600 years of the city's history uh, was removed without any record. In the 1980s and 1990s there were a number of schemes to excavate more of the amphitheatre and uh, construct various facilities on the site, but these came to nothing. Uh, between 2000 and 2003, Keith Matthews of Chester Archaeology carried out a small number of trial excavations, and these showed just how much information survived on uh, areas that had supposedly uh, previously been excavated. And he came up with uh, some new interpretations of the development of the building. In 2004, a new plan was agreed between uh, English Heritage, as it was then, and the Chester City Council. And these led to further excavations between 2004 and 2006, uh, which re-examined part of the uh, seating bank and also uh, areas to the south of the uh, peasant retaining wall and these have refined our understanding of the uh, construction of the, of the Roman amphitheatre and also of the later history of the site quite considerably. So the, uh, the uh, first version of the amphitheatre that we call Amphitheatre 1A uh, was uh, built in the 70s of the first century AD, uh, more or less at the same time as the uh, legionary fortress. The first stage in building it was to lay out the arena that you can see over there. Um, it was uh, laid out as parts of four circles and had a dimension of 58 metres uh, by 45 metres. Then uh, an outer wall uh, at the back of the seating pack was constructed. Uh, uh, that was uh, just over 13 metres from uh, the arena wall and was just over uh, uh, 2 metres thick. In Roman terms, this meant that the seating bank was in total uh, 45 Roman feet uh, wide and the uh, wall was 7.5 uh, metres wide. Uh, 
Uh, at this stage, the uh, amphitheatre only had north and south entrances. Uh, there weren't any entrances at the, the east and west. We know this because we found we demolished remains of the outer wall running across the uh, later east entrance. A few years later, probably in the 90s of the first century, uh, this amphitheatre was modified, and this is what we call Amphitheatre One Day. The uh, earth seating bank that had been uh, uh, made up of the upcast from the excavation of the arena uh, uh, was levelled and a timber uh, seating uh, framework was installed. Uh, this consisted of uh, uh, triangular frames made of ash and beech. Uh, these were prefabricated. We know this uh, because uh, of the positions of nails that could, uh, couldn't have been driven in once the frames were in position. And these were attached to what we call a drillage of radial uh, timbers embedded in the earth. And you can see reconstructions of these uh, on, the, on the site now. Uh, it may be that at this time that the uh, arena wall that survives today uh, uh, was built and patches of plaster have been found that show uh, it was decorated in a marbled effect with uh, red, yellow and white paint. In addition, at the back of the uh, outer wall uh, steps were installed and uh, making calculations based on typical of angle step angles of steps where we can guess that the outer wall was probably about 50 uh, Roman feet high. A Roman foot, by the way, is just a little bit less than um, the foot that we still use in Britain today. Uh, finally, uh, just to the uh, west of the later east entrance, a shrine was built dedicated to the goddess Nemesis. And we'll see uh, uh, that and the uh, uh, altar inside it in a few minutes. At a later date, probably in the uh, early 3rd century, but we don't know precisely uh, when, the amphitheatre underwent a, a major reconstruction and this may have coincided with a reconstruction of the fortress as a whole. The original outer wall of the uh, seating bank was demolished and another one was built another 15 Roman feet uh, further out and this made it into the uh, largest amphitheatre in Roman Britain. Uh, uh, in addition to that, uh, east and west entrances were added to the original north and south ones uh, and uh, uh, st uh, between the major entrances, staircases were added to uh, <coughs> take uh, participants up to the gangway, which ran at middle level uh, around uh, the seating banks. Uh, and th these are what we call vomitoria. At a later date, uh, the amphitheatre was enlarged. This is what we call amphitheatre two. And it's in this phase that it becomes the largest and the most architecturally elaborate amphitheatre in Britain. Unfortunately, uh, this uh, uh, elaboration is in inverse proportion to the state of survival of the amphitheatre today. And for this reason, uh, we can't be sure uh, uh, of the, the actual date of reconstruction. But we think it was in the early first century AD uh, when the uh, fortress of Chester was rebuilt as a whole. The uh, outer wall of the first amphitheatre was knocked down and a new outer wall, uh, uh, 15 Roman feet further out, uh, uh, was constructed. Uh, in addition, uh, uh, the amphitheatre now had uh, four entrances uh, east and west as well as north and south and we think that uh, the north and south entrances were probably uh, modified uh, 
in addition, between each of the major entrances, uh, staircases were inserted to take uh, uh, visitors uh, up to a gangway uh, halfway up the seating bank. Uh, these were what we call vomitoria. We were very lucky uh, in that it, uh, uh, one of these vomitoria, excavated by Keith Matthews, uh, the first two steps uh, survived and this gave us a gradient um, and showed that this gangway was uh, uh, would let, uh, this gangway uh, had a height of 15 Roman feet and so uh, the total height of the seating bank uh, at the uh, point of the back wall would have been uh, 30 feet. I, again, it, I find it really interesting to uh, think about the modules uh, uh, in which uh, the amphitheatre was uh, built, uh, about seven and a half feet uh, for the walls, uh, 45 feet uh, front to back for the first amphitheatre, and then 60 feet uh, for uh, uh, the second amphitheatre, and having a gangway f uh, 15 feet uh, up. Um, it, sh it shows the uh, ways in which uh, the Roman engineers and architects thought. Unfortunately, from this phase, uh, uh, no evidence has survived for uh, the construction of the seating banks, but uh, we think that the lower part of the uh, seating bank, below the central gangway, was probably of earth, and uh, the upper part uh, would have been of timber. And the uh, capacity of uh, the amphitheatre could have been in the region of 7,000 to 8,000 people. This has been calculated uh, using dimensions of modern day uh, uh, cinema seats, uh, aircraft seats and so on. So here we, here we are in the north entrance which sloped down uh, directly from the road outside the uh, amphitheatre in, into the arena and it had uh, steps on each side of the uh, gateway into the arena leading up to the uh, uh, gangway immediately behind the uh, arena wall. The ones you can see here are on the uh, east side. There would probably have been steps on the west side as well uh, uh, going up over the Shrine of Nemesis. What's particularly interesting, uh, uh, if you look carefully, uh, uh, into the each side of the threshold here you can see uh, holes lined with lead and those were where the uh, bottom pivot pins of uh, the uh, doors blocking the entrance uh, would have been dropped. Uh, in putting the door in place the top pivot pin would have been forced up into a hole into the lintel and then it would have been um, dropped down into an iron collar uh, secured by the lead that you can see here today. Notice that uh, uh, with these uh, rebates on uh, the entrance, uh, uh, it's clear that the uh, gates would have uh, opened inwards into the gate passage. As we walk around the uh, outer face of the um, uh, wall of uh, Amphitheatre 2, note the uh, reconstructed uh, bases for the pilasters that would have decorated uh, uh, the outer face of the wall. Uh, again, these are at, spaced at uh, 15 feet uh, centres uh, uh, using the same module that we find uh, elsewhere in the geometry of the building. is a replica of a stone that was found uh, during an excavation uh, in 2004 <coughs> in the uh, uh, centre of the arena, just to the south of the retaining wall here. 
uh, uh, it was a large block of sandstone with the remains of um, an iron loop uh, 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 secured into it by lead. Uh, yeah, this was almost certainly <coughs> the remains of a tethering stone used to secure uh, condemned criminals or uh, beasts who were supposed to be fighting each other um, uh, in the arena and uh, to stop them uh, cowering against the arena wall where they couldn't be seen. Um, <coughs> uh, similar, blocks, uh, similar blocks had been found uh, elsewhere in the uh, arena during the excavations in the 1960s, but uh, it was never appreciated uh, uh, what, uh, what they were. A similar block, in fact, although uh, obviously much later, uh, has been found at Audlem in South Cheshire and was used there uh, to secure uh, a bear that was being baited. The, the entrance from uh, the passage uh, into the arena was narrowed at this time and uh, used uh, three pieces of a former uh, Roman threshold block. Um, uh, one piece as the uh, threshold of uh, the new door and two uh, here and here as the jams. Uh, it's got um, lots of cuttings in it, um, possibly for um, uh, uh, locking bars and so on, but uh, we don't uh, really understand these in any detail. Oh, thanks Peter, that, that, that's really interesting. So do we know what happened to the amphitheatre at the end of Roman rule? Uh, and looking down at the, uh, the, the church crypt-like structure, uh, I wonder is it linked to St John's Church there? Where are you going? Right. Uh, finds in a build-up of soil uh, in the arena uh, showed that the building has uh, ceased to be used as uh, an amphitheatre uh, in <coughs> the 270s AD, uh, fully a century before the Roman army uh, eventually left Chester. Then late, uh, later, uh, the steps in the staircase uh, to the west of the uh, north entrance were walled up. Um, it, this is a clear sign of a change of use. We also see a path being laid across the arena from the north entrance, uh, patchy stone surfaces uh, in the arena, and also the, uh, we find uh, foundations of uh, lean-to buildings uh, um, uh, against the arena wall. So, uh, at some time early in the post-Roman period, um, uh, occupation of a, is still happening in the amphitheatre, but it's of a radically different time. Uh, turning to the uh, east entrance, uh, uh, you can see that new uh, stonework of a very different character from the Roman stonework was inserted in the path of the entrance passage uh, near the arena uh, with steps uh, on the south side uh, 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 going down. Uh, uh, these are very well worn uh, and uh, were presumably in use for quite a long period. Uh, we now think that uh, this structure was either the uh, crypt of a church inserted uh, into the entrance, or possibly a tower. Uh, uh, we find uh, churches inserted into amphitheatres um, elsewhere in the Roman Empire, for example at Duresh in Albania and uh, at Tar Tarragona in, in Spain. So uh, here we are in the east entrance. Uh, this was the uh, widest of the entrances at uh, 25 feet um, and uh, was aligned with the main road uh, coming into Chester from the east. <coughs> uh, as you can see, it uh, led st uh, straight down from the Roman ground level outside uh, into the arena. Uh, uh, when it was excavated, there was a path uh, going down the centre into the arena um, and we think this may have been reserved for people where, with animals uh, uh, possibly going down uh, <coughs> uh, the paths left at either side. In addition to this main passage, uh, there were uh, extra narrow passages to each side and these led 
from the external ground surface, not down into the arena, but to the gangway uh, uh, immediately behind the arena wall. And this would have been where the most uh, important uh, uh, visitors sat. So to get into these uh, passages, you would have come in uh, from the outside, and then uh, you would have turned left or right uh, through doorways uh, marked by um, uh, this uh, threshold stone there, and a missing one on the opposite side. Um, uh, and you can, in this threshold stone, you can see the rebate uh, uh, where <coughs> a stone uh, uh, jam uh, uh, would have sat. You, you would have walked in there and then turned right and walked down to the gangway immediately behind the arena. Oh, thanks, Peter. That's really interesting. I wonder what, what happened to this uh, church-like crypt structure. I wonder, is it linked to St. John? That's a really good uh, question, Andrew. We, uh, we haven't got a firm answer, but it's um, a really interesting story. Let's go and sit uh, somewhere closer to St. John's uh, uh, church, and then we can talk about what we know about the early history of St. John's. According to legend, St. John's Church was founded in uh, AD 689 by King Ethelred of Mercia and it became an important church. Uh, supposedly, uh, Edgar was rowed there in uh, 973. Um, in 1054, Earl Leofric of Mercia enriched the church and in 1075 uh, it became, uh, very briefly, um, a, a cathedral and the, uh, the church was uh, considerably rebuilt. Uh, there is an important collection of early medieval crossheads, um, uh, which were probably grave markers, um, uh, found in the churchyard uh, in the 19th century. Um, and in addition, uh, two uh, crossheads were found, uh, one uh, alongside the uh, route of the proposed road across the amphitheatre in the 1930s and a further one uh, in the core of the city wall by the Roman South East Angle Town. Um, so it looks as if uh, there was a uh, graveyard belonging to the church somewhere in, in this area. In, Deans in Doomsday Book, um, uh, there was a part of the city called the uh, Bishop's Borough uh, uh, in this part of the city. Uh, it probably uh, included St. John's Church and may have taken in the area of the amphitheatre as well. Uh, in addition to the uh, uh, crosshead from uh, Grave Mark that I mentioned, uh, when Trident House uh, was built in the 1990s, there were excavations in that area and on the uh, south side of the amphitheatre two uh, uh, burials were found and one was radiocarbon dated to the 10th century AD. After the Norman conquest the south side of the amphitheatre uh, came to be occupied by ecclesiastical buildings uh, while the north side uh, by Vickers Lane uh, was occupied by domestic buildings with the uh, arena area, which is presumably still a hollow, uh, uh, came to be in infilled by garden soils. Uh, we've seen the, the same pattern of development in London, uh, where uh, the arena, um, um, the amphitheatre arena, uh, is now occupied by the Guildhall Yard uh, with the uh, medieval Guildhall building on the uh, north side of the amphitheatre and the Church of St. Lawrence Jewellery on the, on the south side. After the dissolution in 1547, uh, many of the uh, ecclesiastical outbuildings around the church uh, uh, passed into the hands of the local gentry. For example, St. Anne's Chapel uh, uh, to the east of the church, uh, 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 what is now the west end of Grosvenor Park uh, was taken over by uh, Sir Hugh Chumley as his townhouse. Uh, uh, in 
the um, uh, fill of the arena, uh, we found a Tudor pit uh, which is absolutely full of um, animal bones of various sorts. And I'll have to consult my notes here uh, for the list of bones. It's um, absolutely so long. Uh, uh, we found beef, uh, veal, mutton, lamb, pork, suckling pig, venison, rabbit, hare, wild and domestic birds, oysters, mussels and a uh, range of fish. In addition, uh, we found uh, a tin glazed mug uh, in the shape of an owl and also a gold ring uh, belonging to a sergeant at law who was a very high-ranking high barrister. So uh, we know that there were very wealthy people living in this area. Uh, many of the buildings here uh, including Sir Hugh Chum Chumlis, um, were destroyed uh, during the Civil War uh, when a parliamentary uh, gun battery was placed in St John's uh, churchyard. After the uh, war, as a, a slow rebuilding commenced, uh, the earliest sign we've got of this is a date stone of 1664, uh, found amongst the remains of St John's uh, house, uh, which was uh, just to one side of the north entrance of the amphitheatre. Uh, the, the house itself was originally built in 1730, I think, uh, for James Cumberbatch, who was a wealthy merchant and uh, who had been mayor of Chester in 1727. Uh, 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 Chumley's uh, mansion was uh, rebuilt in the uh, first half of the uh, 18th century, uh, as was uh, St John's House and the Bishop's Palace to the south of D House. Thanks, Peter. So, why is D House important? How does it fit into the picture of the amphitheatre? Uh, can you tell us a bit more about it? Uh, D House uh, may look like just another Georgian house, but it was, in fact, quite carefully. Uh, uh, design. It's got uh, uh, quite careful uh, moulding, uh, typical of uh, the period, around its front door. And if you look carefully at it, the uh, spacing of the windows to the left of the front door uh, uh, on the ground floor are more widely spaced than those uh, to the uh, uh, to the right. Um, uh, showing where the uh, major rooms were. Essentially, uh, this area was uh, built as a villa suburb, a cross between a villa suburb and a cathedral close. And uh, in that area, uh, uh, D, D House would have been a small country house set in uh, uh, quite elaborate grounds. So, Peter, what's left to discover with this fantastic uh, archaeological site? Most of the rest of the story of the house is uh, tied up with the uh, uh, Catholic revival after the Emancipation Act of 1829. In 1854, uh, uh, the building was acquired by uh, an order of nuns, the faithful companions of Jesus, uh, who wanted to use it as a church. But uh, the first Catholic Bishop of Shrewsbury, James Brown, uh, decided that he wanted to be a school. Uh, in 1867, uh, the Liverpool architect uh, Edmund Kirby um, uh, built uh, this uh, brick uh, extension, um, uh, which incorporated a chapel on the uh, ground floor. And the height of this uh, uh, building is really symbolic because it, it competes uh, with the uh, Anglican Bishop's uh, Palace uh, over to the south and also the uh, west, church, west tower of St John's Church, uh, which fell down in 1881. In 1925, uh, the uh, school was taken over by the Ursulines uh, of, of Clue who converted it into a convent school. And it was when uh, they extended uh, the uh, building to the south that the first uh, 
be made from the amphitheatre to be discovered. So in a way, uh, the story has come full circle. Uh, the school closed in 1976, and the uh, building was taken over by British Telecom, who occupied it until the 1990s. And after that, uh, it was acquired by the city council. We now think that we've uh, got um, a quite a sound understanding of the development of the Roman amphitheatre. And we also know that the parts that aren't generally exposed uh, don't survive particularly well. Uh, 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 what would be interesting to know more about is, first of all, the, the western entrance, where, which it's been conjectured uh, was a vomitorium, just a staircase. Um, rather full with entrance because of the uh, proximity of the Sutrafane ravine, but that's not certain. Uh, also, uh, because of the way uh, it was excavated, uh, we don't uh, re really understand uh, securely the development of the northern entrance, and it may be uh, that if we could excavate the uh, south entrance, which lies in the uh, car park of Trident House, the, uh, the family courts, uh, that might fill the gap with our knowledge. Uh, but what it would be really exciting to know uh, more about is what was happening um, uh, after the Romans left, because the uh, period between the AD 380s, uh, uh, when the Roman coins uh, in Chester paid out, and uh, the refortification of Chester uh, by uh, Ethelfred of Mercia, based on the uh, uh, Roman wars. That's still a bit of a dark age. Uh, so uh, that is uh, uh, something that's really fascinating. Uh, but the first stage uh, in doing that has to be to uh, bring together all the bits of information that we've already got. Uh, The thing that would be most exciting to learn about in the area is early medieval, that is, uh, Saxon uh, period occupation. For, uh, for Chester, the period uh, between the, the end of Roman occupation, which seems to have come uh, sometime in the 380s, and the foundation of the Burr by Ethelfled of Mercia in AD 907, which would have uh, been used in uh, large part the walls of the Roman fort. They're still a bit of a dark age. Uh, uh, so I think the first thing to do is to uh, pull together all the bits of information that we've uh, got, both from the recent excavations of 2004 to 2006 and uh, the unpublished information from the 1960s excavations and see uh, uh, what we may of those, and it may be that this part of Chester turns out to be the heart of uh, the uh, Middle uh, Saxon settlement. That would fill a major gap in our uh, understanding of the history of Chester. Uh, thanks very much must go to Peter Carrington and Julian Baum. What a great pair of, of members of uh, Chester Archaeological Society. They are very lucky to have these guys. It's been great fun uh, and hopefully something that we can use uh, on our website and also something for the Chester Heritage Festival. Thank you both.